I'm Margaret Garcia. to sit in the living room which is about 25 steps above ground level and looking out of our front living room window you can feel like you're sitting in a tree house because you're looking through the leaves of the trees that sit outside our window and you're looking across at a, a huge mulberry tree which provides tons of habitat for you know, doves and parrots and pigeons and squirrels. And, and so we always talk about the animal spirits in the garden. We've got these spirits and we try to provide that habitat with, you know, be, being able to look at the, the native plants and flowers that are there, the, the hilltop poppies and the fuchsias and the, right now we have some hanging bugambilla and uh, the hummingbirds, keeping the hummingbird feeders fed, and, I mean, full, and watching the little birds that, that come out and flit and fly around our window. It's like a little piece of paradise. And I get that every morning, and I get to just sort of relish in it. A little flavor here. The, the eggs always appreciate a little butter. Uh, when I get in, up in the morning, it usually takes a moment for me to catch my bearings until I've had that coffee, whether he's making it or whether I'm making it. This is the feast. Like, what are you planning today? What are you planning today? Oh, are you free? Oh, tonight I teach. Oh, I'm, or sometimes he'll say he's going to meet uh, his friend Becerra and have lunch with him, or, or if he's got a dental appointment, or if I have an appointment with somebody, and we, we sort of coordinate and try to plan, oh, you, what do you want to eat for dinner? You want me to take something out? Do you want to eat out? Are you going somewhere? Do you want to go somewhere? A lot of times we want to go somewhere, but we, we also don't. We enjoy just staying at home in our little casita and um, just nesting. I enjoy nesting. So uh, once we know what each other is doing, I pack up my stuff, uh, my laptop, my iPad, my purse, sometimes my dogs, and I get in the car and come to the studio.
I would say the exhibit I saw at uh, the Norton Simon with Jalinski. There was something about Jalinski's portraits that just, it, my first reaction was I was just kind of baffled and, and confused and I looked at that, but the, his portraits, they haunted me. They stayed with me and it was like, oh my God, you know, and I, I couldn't get them out of my mind. And, you know, I left LA and I went to Chicago and, and I could, I found myself searching for those portraits, even though they weren't to be found anywhere. And um, because they, they startled, they, they kind of startled my psyche. And, and they had such a strong impact and they said so much to me compared to what I had always seen before. For me, you know, like, I just love, love, love color. I do, I do, I just love it. I love the thick, I love thick paint and I, I love to feel that it's almost like you're carving it out. You're, you're not just uh, looking at something and it's flat, you're, you're feeling it. And it, it, there's a vibration, there's an energy. The brush strokes are important because they document your pulse. And what is your pulse? It's your heartbeat. It's the way you feel about what you're looking at. And what you feel about what you're looking at is as important as an exact image or replica or likeness. Because you, it can look exactly like something, exactly like a photograph and be stone cold. It's about whether or not you can capture the, the feeling that you have or that, that it gives you how precious it is to you or how much you love it or you don't love it. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna celebrate, you know, that for me, I wanna use my, my art to sort of celebrate life and nature and the things that I love and the people that I love and the, you know, I want to celebrate those things. Well, I think that as a child, my father said to me when I came home with my crayon drawings, he said, you're an artist. And I, I think I just loved that he said that. And he was so like, you can be anything you want. His attitude was always like that. And I believed him. And I thought that was the best thing I could ever want to be. But I don't think that I got to the point of trying to realize it until, um, I mean, I, I took art classes in high school and junior high, and I, and I remember those teachers. But Roberto Chavez, who gave me drawing lessons at ELAC. Now, I wasn't in the ELAC. I lived across the street from ELAC. I was going to high school. He allowed me to audit and just come in and practice charcoal drawing and drawing and hand-eye coordination. And I thought, you know, to be an artist is something that I think would be so difficult to accomplish. And instead of just telling myself I didn't have enough um, skill or talent or I didn't know what it took or it, it was just a difficult field or any of that I just said to myself I think I'll just take up the act of practice the the discipline of doing and just see where it gets me and not worry about whether or not I can become an artist but allow myself to enjoy the process of of drawing, of painting, of doing those things. Uh, Roberto Chavez was one of those people that helped me and also my creative writing teacher. He said, you know, if you wanna be a writer, 
but you don't read, you're not going to be very good. So if you want to be a painter, you want to be an artist, you need to look at art. You need to go to openings. You need to go to galleries. You need to go to the museum. You need to buy books. You need to look at art. Because if you're trying to be an artist and yet you're not willing to look at what's already been done or how it communicates or pick up any of those skills, then you're probably not going to be very good. Well, I like working in cadmiums, and uh, uh, the way I set up my palette, actually starting with alizarin and going into cadmium red deep, all the way to cadmium yellow light and then radiant yellow, is the perfect kind of palette to express fire. It, it glows, because you can layer it in such a way that you can create that luminosity. Um, and working on black paper is perfect. I, I had seen uh, Carlos Almaraz's uh, pastels back in, I believe, 84 to 86, and I had seen some of the works up at the, at the Municipal Art Gallery when he exhibited up there. And, and I thought, yeah, you're right you need to be painting fire and I wanted to paint fire too. And it's interesting because in, in, in conversations, and I just got to say this, in conversations with Frank Romero, when he talked about Carlos Almaraz painting fires, he said, whenever there was a, a, a fire engine going, Carlos would follow the fire <laughs> engine and, and, uh, Frank accused him of becoming a, an ambulance chaser or something like that. And I thought that was amusing because I, I tried to, to picture that. I don't follow fire <laughs> engines, but I look at a lot of the fires on, online. You know, I Google my fires and I'm looking at all these fires and they're not precise. You know, I'm not a how should I say, you know, my work is not photographic. It's, it, it tends to be rather expressive. My hand is very heavy handed. My, my work, my hand is a very heavy handed hand and I, I sort of work off of that. Uh, I put a lot of uh, fixative on my work, but because my, my hand is heavy, um, there is a lot there that sticks and I try to make sure that it, it's well fixed so that it's not going to float off to the glass the way I've seen a lot. And it's not soft, I mean it's pastel, but even though it's pastel, it, 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 I'm not so ethereal about my use of it. I'm not so delicate, I'm a bit heavy handed.
I was coming home from a party in Pasadena and it was a cold and windy and rainy night. I didn't want to take the freeway, so I took uh, side streets from Pasadena, cutting through Highland Park to get to Silver Lake. When I was driving down Figueroa in Highland Park, um, in all this darkness and all this rain and in all of this gloom, uh, there was this studio that was wide open with this beautiful light. And I was driving pretty comfortable on 40 miles per hour and I put on the brakes. I went, <laughs> I said, I gotta go check this out. So I, I parked my car and I walked across the street um, and it was this beautiful studio. I mean, I didn't even bother knocking. I'm assuming because it was wide open um, that someone was having a party in this neighborhood and I walked right in and it felt like I just entered heaven. It was beautiful. It was bright and colorful. And uh, they introduced me to Margaret Garcia, the artist. And I think that was a, a Friday or Saturday night. And I took classes with her the following Monday. Like I started classes with her immediately. I said, if there was art that I ever wanted to emulate, it would be this. It would be this beautiful, colorful, um, passionate, deeply moving, spiritual art. Um, I liked her worldview, that she was really she was really trying to capture communities in Los Angeles that you know Hollywood was missing. You know, Hollywood was missing, a lot of the art world was missing, a lot of immigrant communities of color of faces that needed to be emblazoned um, into museums and galleries. And I thought, I want to do something like that. Like, I get that. I get that. I'd always been doing work in communities of color. I'd been doing work in LGBT communities. Um, I've been, um, I did AIDS work for 20 years. So I know what it's like to to live and be a part of that marginalized voice. And, and um, when I saw Margaret's subjects, I thought, I'm not seeing these faces in museums. I'm not seeing these faces in galleries, you know? Um, and there was something really moving about that, you know, that she was painting people that fell beneath the cracks, you know, or fell between the cracks. And these people deserve to be heard. These people deserve to be represented. These people deserve to be seen. Well, when I first met Margaret, I got a sense of a woman who had been doing this for a very long time. She had been doing her craft for a very, very, very long time. And uh, she felt centered and she felt like a, a master. Like this was a master painter. Um, I got that immediately, and I wanted to study with uh, with somebody like that. But the art world can be very unforgiving. It can be very biased. I mean, it's a the art world can be a very white world. To be a Latina whose subject is people of color that doesn't give a lot of entree into the art world. It can be, as much as they say they really care for, for important creative voices, creative forces out there. You know, let's say it what it is. The art world can be very racist, you know, very uncaring. And I think Margaret knew that. And I think that there were other artists who had gotten attention when she should have gotten that kind of attention. Yet at the same time, I have to, when she says things like, well, there are enough paintings of white people in the world, and I've seen this many, 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 many times um, for, uh, for people who say things like that, the person they end up loving, the person they end up falling in love with is some white person. <laughs> I've seen that so many times. And she found a great guy in Rhett. Um, and 
I've seen the portraits that she's done of rats. And boy, she loves that man. You know, boy, I mean, you can, you know, the attention she pays to painting Rhett is so beautiful and so loving. I'm glad that Margaret was able to find that later on in her life. You know, I think Margaret, that she's a loving person and she needs someone to love, and I don't think she's had someone to love in a while. So to, to meet someone, to love somebody, I think that is like the best. I mean, that is the best reward. You know? To find someone to love, who loves you back, who cares for you, ah, perfection. Great. The wind comes this way, and as the breeze blows, you know it's got this counterweight. You know, just... And then a big wind blows. Margaret and I met at a photography opening. About halfway through the the evening, I migrated myself toward the migrated myself toward the the food table, and uh, Margaret was sitting there. And I said, "Excuse me, and uh, would you mind if I reach for the food?" And she says, "No, oh, not at all." She I said, "Oh, they have taquitos," and she said, "Yes, won't you dip it in the guacamole?" So we both had a little laugh, and you know, I stepped back and we introduced ourselves, and. Um, and I knew her work. And I said, oh, I know you. She said, I'm Margaret Garcia. And I said, I know you. I've known your work for years. And so we talked for a little bit, and she invited me over to, to sit for a portrait. And no one's ever invited me to sit for a portrait. So I said, sure, and especially, you know, someone like Margaret's of, you know, her portrait stature. And so we went. I went. And uh, we just had a fun talk while she painted me. And about an hour later, um, she says, I'm done. I said, you're done? And she said, yes. And so I think we went to have dinner and, you know, years later, you know, we've been married six years and there's three or four years where we weren't married. And so we just celebrated our sixth anniversary and, you know, here we are living in this wonderful little garden we live in and here in Echo Park. And uh, we live our life. You know, during the day we do our chores, a little house, you know, got shade and sun. We live in a tree house actually on this hillside. And so we just spend the day, you know, in the mornings we get our little chores done and, and then we just go on with our day and the day's various things. Sometimes Margaret paints, sometimes, you know, she'll do work or I'll do work and I'm oftentimes scampering up the hill and scampering down the hill and building, uh, you know, cleaning up the garden and straightening it up and you know this garden's I've been working on it for 20 years and now it's at a point where all I have to do is maintain it. Margaret over the years for many many years and particularly right now in, in her in her work she paints plein air. She has a bunch of partners she paints with Ruben Zavala's one, Bonnie Lambert and they're they're plein air painters and this garden that we're sitting in right now has been the subject of uh, quite a few of Margaret's painting and quite a few of the other painters who they paint here on occasion. And Margaret paints from the front, she paints from the back. And um, <clears throat> it's really interesting. Moving to Los Angeles, there's this whole other art world and, and uh, there's a big Chicano art community here, which I thought was very cool. and. Um, so I would go to shows, but I really didn't have much of a connection until I was hired by Los Angeles Metro to lead the design of both the system-wide landscape architecture and the design of seven light rail stations. And so um, as part of my job, as part of the station design, as part of the system-wide landscape design, 
it were a bunch of artists. And so each station had an artist, the overall had a landscape had an artist, and several of these artists were Chicano painters. And so at that point, you know, I got to know these people, these artists, and working with them and integrating the art into the stations. And so um, as I got to know them, they would invite me, you know, to, to come to their show or they would introduce me to somebody. And, you know, over time, I, I, you know, I got to know the, some people in the world. And, uh, and this was in the early 90s. And so I'm working with a bunch of Chicano artists and, and uh, you know, it's a very interesting world that I'm introduced to. And I, I continue going to the show and, you know, as my work, as I finished that project and went on, you know, somewhere else and moved to Sacramento for a while for some projects and, you know, I, I, I still go to art galleries. And uh, so when I met Margaret at, at Tom's opening, you know, I already knew her. I already knew a lot of the community and, and she, you know, she used to laugh and said, how come I just met you? You know, you know all these artists, you know, you know Wayne Healy, John Valdez and all these people. You knew them, you know, before I knew them. How come they never introduced me, you know? I think that it kept coming in, in my, out of my life, art, you know, seeing the murals in the hood, uh, seeing, you know, what they were doing, you know, watching people create artwork, you know, and, but then, you know, I'm on, but on the other side, you know, I'm out there on the street, you know, but I kept looking back, you know, and it kept calling me, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to explain the calling, but something you feel here in your heart and in your mind and in your body, it's like you want to be that person. And it's like you're, I guess, either you're forced or you're put, or you put yourself into that life, you know, but something else kept pulling me, you know, I got to do this, you know, and, you know, meanwhile, all these people are dying around me, you know, it's like I still got to keep doing artwork. When I was at age uh, 16, you know, we're driving around, you know, and bullets started coming into the car, you know, two people, uh, one person got killed next to me, one person took it in the back. You know, but me, I had no bullets, you know, I walked out, you know, so it's, but I still kept doing artwork. So then when you start seeing the flashes from the guns going off, then, you know, there's white light, you start thinking, I got to get out of here, I got to do artwork. You know, of course, you know, everybody may think different, and that's fine. You know, we all have our choices, nuestros destinos, our path. Then I met Margaret, and uh, she started showing me around, you know, and uh, I remember she had this little white car. I think it was like a 67 or something. I don't remember what it was. It was small. And we, she drive, I, you know, she went to go do a mural. So I helped her. I believe it was in uh, Cypress Park. And I helped her and then I got my first award. You know, she created it, of course, but as a, you know, an appreciation of help or something like that. That was the first time I ever got anything and that really helped out, you know. Uh, motivation. You know, I was like highly motivated to create artwork. And then she kept helping. You know, I guess it was like, it was, it was a good feeling, you know, and then from there I just kept going, you know, wanted to do that. You know, I got in trouble again, you know, and uh, it's like I said, it's a tug of war for your soul, you know, and I got in trouble again. But yeah, I believe that it's for a good reason, you know, sometimes you got to nip things at the bud and pull the roots out. So when I got in trouble again, I was a little bit older, but, you know, still stupid, you know, dumb, you know, hanging out with the wrong crowd, 
you know, I won't get into specifics, but, you know, it was a shameful thing, but in a way it was good because how people get to go to art school and they develop their, their skills and things like that. The art school that I went to was a state penitentiary, you know, and from there, I mean, I've seen a lot of uh, horrors and stuff in there, you know, I said, but you get used to it. You know, it's just growing up in the hood, but, you know, in more of a controlled environment. And so you become institutionalized, but I refused to be institutionalized. What I did was I kept doing artwork in there. I would say art saved my life, and I'm very grateful to that. You know, people may see things differently. I said, but that's okay. I mean, everyone is entitled to their opinion, you know, but art did save me. You know, and I think that, you know, other people can be saved too because a uh, uh, soul is worth saving. You know, I used to talk with Margaret about her backgrounds and say, you know, you need to put something in the background. We used to sort of joke around about that. But as far as her use of color in this figure and the, and the paint strokes, it's just incredible how beautiful it is. Uh, the one below it is a portrait done by Margaret. I'm not sure when she did this exactly, um, but I love this portrait. Her portraits are flawless. You know, all of the features are just perfectly done. And yet it is simple and it's colorful. And it really speaks to me. The eyes pop out. She's so good at doing portraits. I really admire her for that. The simple line that's around the hair. It's beautiful. This painting is Izzy, Margaret's dog, playing with the ball. And I love this painting. It's so simple, yet it really captures Izzy's essence. This painting is titled Graffiti with Palm. It's of a scene that was shot, I photographed originally, and I'm not sure where, it's probably Boyle Heights. And I started this in Margaret's studio. I did not have a place big enough to paint it at home or in my subsequent studio. Her studio at the time was a gallery. She called Gallery Del Mundo, I believe. And I went to see her work there. Uh, but Avenue 50 would send out emails. I got on their mailing list. And I received a notice that she was going to be teaching the painting class there. I was very excited. And I ran right out and I bought materials for painting. They were all the wrong materials, but I bought the materials for painting. And I said, I'm going to show up and do that class. This is my moment where I'm going to learn painting. She had us all sit at our table she told me my materials were wrong, but she had brought some paint and I had a little canvas board. And she had set up a teapot that was a small still life for us to start painting. She gave us a basic lesson, starting with one color. And I just started painting. She had given us a little bit of instruction, but by the end of the night, I had a complete little painting of a teapot. And people were packing up and people were leaving. And she came over to me and looked at it and said to me, well, you are a painter. And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> I've never painted before, and I don't know what I'm doing or how to do this. And she just kept repeating, you are a painter. Yeah. 
All right, hold on a second. I didn't choke up at the time. Because here was this woman that I admired so much after seeing her work, maybe for a couple of years at that point, I'd been seeing her work. And, and I had just watched her do an entire painting in half an hour, you know, which just blew me away. And for her to tell me that I'm a painter when I had just done my first painting, that, I, I don't know, it was beyond belief. It was encouraging. You know, that she saw something in me that I had always hoped for, but I had never, I never had the encouragement or, you know, the opportunity to do. Margaret, from the very beginning, from that very first painting she did when I was in her class, showed me that you don't have to agonize over a painting. You can sit down and get it done. That if you're loose and expressive and keep working, that that's the important thing to getting a painting done. It's not to just sit and putter over it. It's to take risks. It's to push your boundaries. It's to take a painting beyond the point where you think you might ruin it. So it's taking risks. It's using color where you think it might not need color or it's the wrong color. It's okay to be experimental. It's okay to distort things. So a lot of it is about freedom, to really free up your creativity and not worry about what the results are. That if you push it as far as you can to put everything out there, you know, to make it real and raw and take risks, then you'll end up with either garbage you'll paint over or something you never imagined that it would be possible for you to ever paint. My husband and I always went to the Arroyo Art Walk, you know, visiting artist studios in the area. And in a, on a Sunday afternoon in 08, we walked in here, and that wall over there was filled with Kiki Eater's work, and the rest of the place was filled with Margaret's work, and there were sofas out there. And I met the two of them for the first time, you know, and sort of introduced myself shyly, you know, told her what I did. And she says, oh, yeah, come. Come, you know, it's every, I forget what it was, Tuesday or something. So the first week of January, I showed up here. I was late because I got lost and uh, started painting with Margaret. And, you know, take away last year with COVID. I've been coming every week for, what is it, like 11, 12 years now. And in um, 2011, Margaret the beginning of the year, she said, you're going to do a solo show. I said, no, no, I can't do that. She said, yes, you're going to do that. It's going to be on this date. You're going to fill this with paintings. And I said, okay, well, I can either pack up and move to another state, you know, or I can do this. And I did. And it was the start. It, it was the start. When I first met Margaret, I, coming here for the Arroyo Art Walk and seeing her the first time, that was different because she was reading, you know, she was, she quietly let me explore the studio. But then class, that was something else. Just, you know, we're kind of checking each other out. And she was intimidating, but, you know, kind and gentle. There were a lot of other students who have since become best friends, really. But, um, and freeing, I think that was the one thing. It, it, not like other teachers who said, well, you have to try this, you have to try this style, you know. She was just, she painted with us, she demonstrated, and I still have the first two paintings that I did from her, you know, little, little tight things. But, uh, yeah, uh, 
I think I remember just taking a deep breath, saying, okay, I'll be back next week. You know, I'll, I'll be back. This is good. I'll give this a try for a while. Um, I don't think it, art was mystified. So it was something that had to be demystified. I think it was just a matter of finding my own language. And when I, wherever I went, they were teaching me their language, which was, you know, some gibberish, you know, it was, it was highfalutin, it was lowfalutin, but it wasn't, it was, it didn't strike that chord. I mean, it didn't, you know how when you're opened up, you're opened up, and that's what I wanted. I would find it for a while, but then when I left that environment, um, I would lose it. I, I lost it. I, I didn't, I was painting mud, you know, I didn't know how to do it. One of Margaret's biggest lessons to me, not so much finding my identity, that's part of it, but finding my own language, it's like somebody being blind and deaf, and they hear the mumblings and now things are opening up. And that's what Margaret did for me. And part of that, oh my, <laughs> is finding my identity. But that was the start. So much, I mean, Margaret's like a big stew of, of rawness and vulnerability, and she's got anger there too, and she's got, you know, humor. She's, she's just everything, and she, she shows it. You know, she, she, shows, she shows that. Margaret is so very approachable. I mean, she does, uh, I was intimidated by Margaret at first. Because she has opinions, she has very strong opinions, and she will air them. But she's, but she'll listen too at the same time. You know that she will listen and consider and be very articulate in her response, responses. So the community of Margaret just keeps growing, you know, just, just keeps growing all the time. And she's branching out too. She's getting into other forms of art, glass, glass work, and, and, uh, instruments and children's toys and, and she's just constantly growing meeting people who introduce her to things and and then there's a new path that she's going down and she brings that all into her classes too yeah she's she's amazing um she changed my life i i, I can't answer that question this, this says it. <laughs> Tears of joy. I mean, I'm just a different person. I'm, I'm, well, no, I'm me. And my art is everything. And she's a good friend now, you know, a mentor, a good friend. We're about the same age, you know, we're, having the same challenges, going through it together. And we push each other. I mean, Margaret always says, you know, she sort of feels the hot breath on her neck, you know, and that's good. I, I like that. And, uh, you know, I learned from her. I love that in, in all of our sessions, Margaret paints with us. And so she's always painting the model or, and um, we're looking at her, you know, how she do, does this, how does she do this? So we're, we're all, we're growing together. Margaret, I wish you the very best. Very, very best. I love you.
Uh, skill is an overrated concept. Talent, you know, that your that you're talent is an overrated concept because I think that to develop skill and to develop the ability to draw and paint uh, or write or whatever your, your field is, it, it takes a certain discipline. If you want it bad enough, then you will work to achieve that. born with not as much talent as somebody else, but you have such a driving desire to communicate and to pick up that skill that you just keep practicing and pushing yourself and, and you, you open yourself up to, to that area. And it depends on how committed and devoted you are to the process of creating art. And I think that's much more important. I was really excited and uh, very happy to see her. I hadn't seen her in a long time. And she surprised me by showing up with her camera because I didn't expect her to photograph me. I never expected to be a subject or for her to take my picture or Brett's picture. And she came up the stairs with her camera and she kind of backed us up into the garden and she took our pictures and I was really honored that I would be a subject for her. Because that's, you know, I just didn't see myself as, as that. I, I, I see myself as a friend and a facilitator more than, than a subject. La primera vez hoy. Porque siempre vengo y platico con ella y digo, le voy a tomar una foto, pero no se puede. Y... Y le dije a Mauricio, tengo que tomarle una foto porque ella es la, la más importante de este proyecto. That, I figure that she's here and she's got a project and I'm not part of that project. She's, that's that. But it's a separate thing. You know? uh -huh. So I don't try to jump in front of the camera. En 1984 eh, me preguntaron eh, los editores de un libro que se llama A Day in a Life en, en Estados Unidos, eh, si quería hacer un proyecto con ellos. Y yo les dije, sí, pero me gustaría que fuera sobre los mexicanos. Entonces fue que conocí a Margaret, la cual me salvó de este proyecto porque ella, muy linda, me llevó a casa de sus eh, sobrinos o amigos, los Cholos, en Isteley. Y ella me llevó a la casa y así tuve una muy buena relación con estas personas de White Fence, en Isteley, gracias a Margarita. Entonces ella es la, la madrina de mi proyecto. Gracias a ella pude hacer este trabajo que ahora lo seguimos haciendo. He regresado varias veces. Pero mi gran sorpresa, porque primero yo conocí a Margaret, pero después la, ya después que vine a verla, vi su estudio, vi lo maravillosa que es como pintora, la calidad humana que tiene. Entonces es, me siento muy feliz de conocerla y la admiro mucho. I'm just really happy because uh, her 
her sensitivity and her skill and the things that she's done has really fed me, you know. And I, I look at what she's done and I look at what she did with Lisa in that, that particular series. And it's like something, it, it feels like, I know it's not me that took the photographs and it's not me that she's photographing and I really shouldn't care, but I, I feel like something good was done. And, and I think that that's just the way that I try to approach so much of what I've done when I, when I mentor people, when I talk to people, the, like, some, like, you know, Bonnie and Kiki and all the other young artists that I work with, because it gives me hope. You know, I look at, like, I look at what she's done. She would not say she would not say she mentored me. She's telling, she's giving me credit for this work. But what I look at what she's accomplished as a woman photographer who has, you know, the courage to hunker down and, and, and reveal what has been before her. I'm just, I don't know. I, I think she's amazing. So uh, I'm just happy to be in any way associated with her. Pero, ¿sabes qué me gusta mucho de Margarita? Porque es artista, muy buena artista. Es una mujer muy politizada. Es una mujer muy humana que ayudó mucho a todo este grupo de, de cholos de una manera maravillosa y que trató de ayudarlos. Y que es una mujer que ha superado muchas cosas y que ha llegado al éxito de una manera increíble porque es muy buen artista pero es muy buen artista pero también es una gente eh, muy generosa una gente que sabe tratar muy bien a la gente eh, muy humana y eso es, me encanta como es ella bien. I think um, that when it comes to the concept of, of making art, a lot of artists I see, I find, I believe, are trying to be unique. They're working at the idea of being unique. And I don't do that so much. I believe that as opposed to trying, trying to be unique, because I think we all are unique, as unique as our handwriting. It's not about being unique for me, it's about being authentic. It's about being the real person in terms of who I really am and what I value and what I love and what I think is beautiful. 